Hi, I'm Angie Davis. I'm the president of Bite Colorectal Cancer. I'm really excited to have Dr. Fola May with us to talk about polyps. Um, polyps are incredibly important to understand, and um, I'll let Fola tell you a little bit about herself and her background and her interest in the area of colorectal cancer and polyp detection. Absolutely. Hi, Angie. It's so great to see you. Hi, everyone. I'm so um, excited to be here and happy to talk about colorectal cancer and polyps and hopefully inform people so they can feel empowered about getting some screening. My name is Fola May. I'm a gastroenterologist and I'm a health services uh, researcher. I work at UCLA Health in Los Angeles and I also work in the Veterans Affairs. Awesome. Um, so let's start with the basics. Fola, what is a polyp? Yeah, that's the big mystery, right? So what is a polyp? Polyps are small outgrowths of cells or tissue that occur in the lining of the colon or rectum. They happen in what we think is upwards of 50% of us, so they're very common. And I like to describe them as kind of like a small pimple that's grown, but inside your colon or rectum. The purpose of us doing a screening colonoscopy is to look for these polyps and take them out because a small percentage of them over time has the potential to progress into a colorectal cancer, which of course we want to prevent. Are there differences between polyps or are all polyps equal? There are so many types of polyps and one of the biggest challenges we have in gastroenterology is that we can't really look at a polyp and tell which ones have that potential to transform into a colorectal cancer. So when we're doing a screening colonoscopy, we actually just take out all the polyps that we see and we send them to our colleagues in pathology where they look at those polyps under a microscope and they tell us about the features of the polyps. And that's where they can tell us whether it's a, a hyperplastic polyp, which is a polyp we're less concerned about, or an adenoma, which is a polyp that is the most common precursor or precondition before a colorectal cancer. But there are also um, serrated polyps or sessile serrated polyps. Um, there are juvenile polyps that we rarely see in certain populations. So it's really hard just to tell by looking at one. When polyps become larger than about a centimeter or when they have some of these characteristics under the microscope that are concerning, that's when we bring people back more frequently for repeat colonoscopy to make sure that we catch all of their polyps over time. What does it mean when a doctor says you have an advanced adenoma? So an advanced adenoma is a subset of polyp that meets certain criteria. First, it is under, un, when examined under the microscope, it falls into the classification of an adenoma which is a specific pattern of growth. Second, if it's called an advanced adenoma, then it has to have one of many characteristics. It can be large because size in itself over a centimeter can categorize an adenoma as an advanced adenoma, or it can have cellular changes that make it fall under the classification for advanced adenomas. So the way that I like to think about it is when you have an adenoma, you can have a low risk adenoma, which is an adenoma that's less than a centimeter and doesn't have any of these microscopic changes, or you can have an advanced adenoma. And those are adenomas that are either large in size, so they're either greater than a centimeter, or they have these characteristic changes like dysplasia, tubular villus formations, that make us more concerned about their potential to transform into a colorectal cancer. You know, if I'm talking to my gastroenterologist, does, does the polyp kind of develop overnight or does it take a long time? Could you tell me a little bit about that? That's probably the biggest difference between a polyp and a pimple because we know pimples can occur overnight. For polyps, it's a little bit different. We think that they grow slowly. So you probably start developing polyps in the, your body in around your 30s or so. And as we age, we develop more and more polyps. So that's why by the time you get a colonoscopy, which hopefully is around 45, we typically will find a polyp in 50% or more of people. But those polyps can take seven or even 10 years or maybe even longer in some cases 
to progress from a polyp form to a colorectal cancer. So we do have some time to capture these. And that's why we're not so worried about colorectal polyps popping up overnight. And that's why we're lucky because we have many times to intervene. So usually for an individual who's getting a colonoscopy at age 45, which is when we recommend everyone start screening, we're finding those polyps before they've had the opportunity to transition into a colorectal cancer, which is the point of screening. Would I feel it? Would I feel a polyp? Would I know that I have a polyp? Unfortunately, most people don't know they have a polyp. And unfortunately, most colorectal cancers in the early stage are asymptomatic, meaning that people don't feel anything at all. Unfortunately, I've had many patients that by the time they have symptoms from their colorectal cancer, it's very late, sometimes stage four disease. So you certainly won't know that you have a polyp unless you've had a colonoscopy or other imaging study to show those polyps in your colon and rectum. Another reason why it's important to get screened at the right time. And when is that? When should I get screened? When should a normal person get screened? Absolutely. And this is what's so important because everything changed. Everything changed in May of 2021 when we had new screening guidelines. So the first thing I like to ask people is if they have a family history of colorectal cancer. 30% of people have a family history of colorectal cancer. And if you've had colorectal cancer in a mother, father, sister, or brother, so first degree, we actually treat you a little bit differently. We want you to start your screening at age 40. We want you to get screened with a colonoscopy over the other methods. And we're usually gonna screen you every five years. If you've had a really young family member with colorectal cancer, we actually will start screening you at the age 10 years before that family member had colorectal cancer. So for some people with a family history, it's even earlier than age 40. And that's why family history is so important. But for everybody else who doesn't have a family history or a condition like inflammatory bowel disease, we call those individuals average risk. And for individuals who fall into that category, We want you to start screening at age 45. And luckily you have seven choices that are recommended by the United States Preventive Service Task Force for how you get this screening done. We wanna take a moment to thank our sponsor, Genoscopy, for helping to support our patient educational resources and allowing us to provide free resources to our community. So which, which tests actually detect polyps? Yeah. So we like to break down the screening test options by how they work. So there are the tests that are um, directly visualizing the colon and the rectum. The most common of these, like the one we've talked about is colonoscopy. And the benefit of a colonoscopy is that we can see the polyp and in the same procedure most times, we can take out the polyp. So you're done and done. Some of the other strategies are uh, two-step processes. The most common of these are the stool-based screening tests like the fecal immunochemical test or uh, the Cologuard test. These tests are actually tests that you can do in the comfort of your own home, which is why a lot of people love this option. And you submit a small sample of your stool. And in the laboratory, we test that stool for evidence of blood or evidence of DNA that might be consistent with a colorectal cancer or polyp. These tools are really good at finding cancers. They do have to be done every year in in the setting of the FIT test and every three years in the setting of the Cologuard test, but they're a little bit less um, sensitive or less um, beneficial at finding polyps, especially small polyps. So that is why individuals with, with family history or high risk are individuals that have who really just wanna get all the polyps out, we actually would offer the colonoscopy as the option to detect the polyps and take them out in one go. But um, as we've talked about a lot, a lot of people don't have access to colonoscopy. In many settings, it's appropriate to start with one of these stool-based tests and only the subset that have an abnormal result, which is somewhere between five and 12% of people will need to have a colonoscopy to complete the screening process. So if I had Crohn's disease, or if I have inflammatory bowel disease or irritable bowel disease, um, or if I have just a really bad, you know, bowel movements all the time, should I do 
a stool-based test or a colonoscopy? Or how should I talk to my doctor about that? What, what's important for, for my doctor to know? This is an important conversation to have with your, your primary care provider, which is why I recommend that everyone start having these conversations with their primary care provider in their early 40s. And if you have a family history, start having these conversations even before then, because it is your medical history and the medical history of your family members that is gonna determine when you start screening. Inflammatory bowel disease is a combination of two conditions, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. These two conditions you will typically know if you have, and those individuals were gonna screen for colorectal cancer very differently because they have a higher risk for developing colorectal cancer. So we usually say that in the individuals who've had inflammatory bowel disease that involves the colon for eight or 10 years, we're gonna start your screening at that point regardless of your age. The other condition you asked about is irritable bowel disease. This is a condition that's usually a combination of abdominal pain and either constipation or diarrhea. It's very different than inflammatory bowel disease. Those individuals will actually go in the average risk category, and they do usually will start their screening at age 45 with one of those modalities that we talked about. That's really helpful. Uh, so I have one last question for you. For the communities that we were talking about, I know we talk a lot about um, various communities, but for communities of color, what do you recommend um, talking about? And just sort of what do you see in, your, in these communities that might be different? The challenging thing about colorectal cancer is that we need to do a better job of educating the public about preventing this disease. Colorectal cancer is the second most common cause of cancer-related deaths in the United States, but it doesn't have to be because it's largely preventable. And unfortunately, there are certain subsets of the population that don't take advantage of screening. We have lower screening rates in African Americans, lower screening rates in American Indians, in Asian Americans, and in Latinos in the United States. So a lot of the work that individuals like me who do health equity research are doing is trying to improve screening utilization or screening use in these groups. And what I usually advise to individuals in these groups is that they have conversations with their doctors about screening early, that they talk about family history among their family members um, as a priority. Unfortunately for colorectal cancer, many times people don't share this history with their family members because of stigma. But that's very unfortunate because it can lead to family members not knowing that they also are at increased risk. So it's very important, especially in communities of color, that we have conversations about cancer diagnoses and cancer risk. And then for individuals that don't have a family history, it's just very important that you talk to your provider at age 45 and you talk about the pros and cons of the different screening tests. Of course, we'd like everyone to have the test that they feel the most comfortable with. And for some people, that is the colonoscopy. They want to go in and have the colonoscopy, have the pulps removed, and potentially they won't need a colonoscopy again for 10 years. But there are a lot of individuals we recognize who have hesitancy about colonoscopy. It is an invasive procedure. It does require anesthesia or moderate sedation. You do have to have a couple days off of work, at least a day and a half to do the preparation the day before and the day of the procedure itself you need to take off of work, which is actually not possible in some subsets of the population who aren't able to take time off for the procedure. So for that reason, we're very lucky that we have these stool-based modalities like the FIT test, like the ColoGuard, and other tests that don't require the time off work and the invasiveness of colonoscopy. So I always like to tell people to get the test that you feel the most comfortable with, just make sure that you get it at the right time. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that. My um, father-in-law, I always call him my polyp factory because he's had three or four colonoscopies and he's had over 13 polyps that he's found over the years. And to this day, we always say screening has saved his life. Um, and we really appreciate you sharing how important it is to know what a polyp is, when to talk to your doctor, and to really think about what the best screening test is for you. Um, but that screening is so important um, once you've hit that glorious age of 45. Um, but thank you for joining us. 
and um, hopefully we'll get to talk to you more about polyps soon. My absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you very much.